Well, we call this uh, chapel service the President's Christmas. I don't know exactly why. It's something I've inherited. Um, and as I, as I turn to Psalm 125, I realize it's not that Christmassy a passage. It doesn't have a specific uh, promise related to the coming of Christ. But as I began to study this passage, I realized it is really a perfect passage of assurance and blessing and prayer for our December graduates, and I think really for all of us. Uh, let's read this psalm together. Actually, the chaplain was supposed to read it. I'll go ahead and do it. Uh, it is Psalm 125. It's uh, a short psalm that makes a strong comparison and then ends with a faithful prayer. Here is what the scripture says. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. For with you is the well of life, and in your light we see light. Well, it is uh, such a privilege to have this one last opportunity to address our December graduates, uh, although I hope to see most of you again in May uh, for baccalaureate and for our commencement exercises. And uh, what a privilege to come to the end of a semester and just reflect on the goodness of God and everything he's done in our lives, and, uh, and also to recognize our need for God's grace in the last week of the semester and then on through the Christmas break with everything God has for us there. If you uh, pay attention to the world around you, you will see many visible signs in creation of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. I had the privilege when I was uh, doing my doctoral work to uh, study the Scottish preacher Thomas Boston, and he, he preached to a very rural congregation. He likes to, liked to use a lot of analogies drawn from nature. And at a certain point he said, every pile of grass is a preacher of the loving kindness of our Lord. That's somebody who really pays attention to what's in the world and draws a spiritual analogy from it. And, and I think the psalmist who wrote Psalm 125 had the same kind of temperament because he compares the mountains and the way that they surround Jerusalem to the unshakable security of people who trust in the Lord. Now, let me just remind you of the context. Psalm 125 is one of these songs of ascent. It's a psalm that the pilgrims sang on their way up to Jerusalem. They were going for Passover or for some other festival. And uh, they, this, was the, this was the soundtrack, this was the playlist, these uh, 15 psalms. And they would sing them on their way to Jerusalem, and they would sing them again after they had arrived. And during that time, the mountains around Jerusalem would have loomed larger and larger on their horizon. And when the psalmist finally reached the city, he was very impressed by what he saw. We were looking at this a few weeks ago in Psalm 122. He, he admired the city walls. He saw how strong they, wa they were, how, how compact the city was. He admired its, its architecture. But as he looked at those strong walls and high towers, he also saw the topography around Jerusalem, which is surrounded by even taller mountains. And this caused him to reflect on his life of faith. And he wanted to make a comparison. Those who trust in the Lord are, li are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. This is how he, he began his song. Now, the psalmist knew that not everyone has what he had, a firm place to stand. In fact, life can be very shaky. I think we had an example of that in the interview that the chaplain did with Jess Weary on Wednesday of how suddenly your life can change in all kinds of ways. 
We have uncertainties about the future. Sometimes we discover how fragile our relationships are. We can, when in the face of sickness and in death, we, we realize how, just how vulnerable we are in our physical well-being. If all we had to stand on was our own two legs, we would be easily moved and suddenly shaken. I wonder what dangers you feel like you are facing in life. Fears about the direction society is heading, concerns about the opposition of the church worldwide and ongoing stories we hear about the persecution of the righteous, fears about the fate of our planet. Where do you find yourself in your relationship with the Lord and how you're, you're thinking about your spiritual situation? I was reading one uh, commentator on this psalm and uh, he quoted just a little phrase from an old song it caused me to reflect. It's an old song by the Young Rascals. Discover the Young Rascals are in their 70s now. I guess they're the old rascals. But uh, what they said in the 1960s uh, is still a relevant question. How can I be sure in a world that's constantly changing, how can I be sure where I stand with you? We may have that question in some of our relationships. We may also have it in our relationship with God. Where do I stand with God? How, I, how can I be sure in this life of faith with all of the doubts I have. The songwriter who wrote Psalm 125 was sure where he stood. And what gave him this sense of security was this experience of climbing up towards Jerusalem and then standing in that city and seeing how secure that city was. Mount Zion, the city of David, built right into the ancient bedrock. And notice who has the same security. It is those who trust in the Lord. It's people of faith. They are the ones who cannot be moved. Here is a song of assurance specifically for people who trust in the Lord for their salvation. It's not, it's not hard to connect this to the life of faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, the New Testament often uses this same imagery to talk about our faith, that Jesus Christ is the rock of our salvation. It's on the confession of faith in Christ as the Son of God, as the living Christ. It's on that rock that Christ has promised that he will build his church. Whatever trouble may come our way through faith in Christ, we are unshakable. He is immovable. Therefore, people who trust in him also are immovable. And what... What confidence this gives us to continue in our service to the Lord, no matter how many challenges we face in our daily calling, no matter what uncertainties we have about the future. That's a, it's a good word at the end of the semester with all the things that remain to be done, all the challenges you're facing. It's a very good word, I think, for our graduates. Questions you have about the future, the plans God has for you. I think a huge part of the Christian faith is not quitting when you are tempted to quit, but know that you shouldn't. It's what theologians call perseverance, just continuing to walk with the Lord, continuing to be faithful to the calling that God has given you with all of the challenges that you face in it. The, the great heroes and heroines of the faith are the ones who never give up and never give in. There are women like Corey Ten Boom, rescuing Jews from the Nazis at the risk of her life. It's men like Nate Saint, who's martyred and brought the gospel to the Wadani people in Ecuador. Yes, we think of people like that, but it's also the ordinary Christians who are doing the simple things of caring for the poor, living out their faith in the marketplace, loving the people around them, being faithful to the ministry that God has given them in the church, just doing that day after day after day even when it's tempting to quit, when you're discouraged, uh, it's persevering to the end. I, I love the words of the Apostle Paul. He talks about our calling to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And what enables people to do that day after day after day is the rock of their faith. Lives not just built on Jesus Christ, but built into him the way a city is built into the bedrock. Now, all of that is the imagery of verse 1. We're, we're, through faith in God, we're unshakable the way Mount Zion is. But there's actually another layer of security here, a kind of 
double protection. Verse 1 is about being grounded by faith. Verse 2 is about being surrounded by God, who is always with us and all around us to protect us. And here, again, it helps to understand the topography of Jerusalem. The city was built on a mountaintop. That's why David's old citadel was called Mount Zion, but it was surrounded by even higher mountains, Mount Scopus, the Mount of Olives. They were these surrounding mountains that were even higher than Mount Zion. And that obviously performed a barrier against assault. And the psalmist stood inside that per protective perimeter. He was feeling safe and secure physically, and he recognized there's a spiritual similitude to here. here. It, it's similar to the way in which I am surrounded by the living God. My soul is surrounded by God's protective presence, and he recognized that's not just now for this moment, but it is forever. What makes this city so safe is that it is the place where God lives. It's a remarkable example of God's encircling protective presence in the story of Elisha at Dothan. It's a story that's told in 1 Kings, uh, 2 Kings chapter 6. The king of Syria was angry with Eli uh, Elisha because every time he came to attack the Israelites, they had already moved. It was as if they knew their battle plans in advance, and it was all because Elisha was prophesying in the name of the Lord, and he was protecting the people of Israel. And finally, the king of Syria decided to go after Elisha. He heard that he was in the city of Dothan. He sent his entire army to capture just this one single prophet. And the prophet's servant, unnamed, wakes up the next morning, and he sees an entire army all around them. Alas, my master, he cries out, what shall we do? But what he failed to realize is that those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. They are surrounded by God's protective presence. And uh, Elisha gave his servant a reassuring word. He said, look, uh, those who are for us are greater than those who are against us. And then he prayed that the Lord would open his servant's eyes. And as the prophet prayed, his eyes were open, and behold, the mountain was full of chariots and ho horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. They, they were surrounded, all right. They were surrounded by God's protective presence. I was thinking about this story and also about the psalm, and it reminded me of a marvelous worship service we had right here in Edmond Chapel last fall when Michael W. Smith was on campus. Some of you were probably part of, part of the uh, orchestra, part of the choir that, on, on that occasion. And one of Michael W. Smith's more recent songs, which has very simple lyrics, it's the song Surrounded. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Uh, it's really coming out of the message of, of Psalm 125, coming out of the story of 1 Kings 6, it may look like we're surrounded by all of the difficulties we have around us, but actually what is truly surrounding us is the protective presence of the living God. And the, the psalmist had that same confession as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. These are good words in times of spiritual danger, through all the stresses of daily life, all kinds of Pressures in our work, in our spiritual walk, in our closest relationships. There's a godless culture around us that is tempting us to unbelief and idolatry and immorality. If we feel surrounded, it's, it's because we are surrounded, but we are more surrounded by the loving presence of God who is the protector of his people. And that's a great promise for our graduates to hold on to. Um, some going perhaps to the fastest paced workplaces, more secular educational environments, uh, facing all kinds of challenges in daily life and just the pressures of our surrounding culture, will you take with you the living presence of God? And we experience that presence through prayer. We experience it through reading the scriptures, hearing the faithful teaching and preaching of God's word. We experience in, in the community of God's people in worship. We experience the presence of God in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And when we know that the Lord is with us, we have the courage to face all of the challenges that we're facing in daily life. We have the courage to live by our Christian convictions, to share the love of Christ, not only with close friends, but also with would-be enemies.
All of this is part of our security in Christ. Now, in verse 3, the psalmist makes something explicit that probably we've been assuming up to this point, and that is that there are no enemies inside the city. If you're safe in the city and you, you've got the mountain beneath you and you've got these walls around you and you're protected, obviously, if you're really going to be safe, there are no enemies in the city with you. Otherwise, you wouldn't feel so secure. But the psalmist makes it explicit. He assures us the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous. It's really a promise coming out of the Old Testament, the promise that God would allot his land, the promised land to his people, and they would dwell secure in that land. And here's a reminder and a reassurance of that promise. But what I think is surprising is what the psalmist identifies as the important reason for this assurance. You might think that the reason God promises to deliver you from enemies is because of the evil things that those enemies would do to you, the harm that would come. And the people of Israel had experienced that. They had experienced that among, from, from the Babylonians, among other things. But that is not the psalmist's concern here. His concern is that being in an evil culture can lead even godly people astray. He says at the beginning of the verse, the scepter of, the, of wickedness will not rest upon the land. Why not? Lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. And there are a number of ways to take this, but I think the psalmist is acknowledging how tempting it is to fall in line with the, the people around you, even if they are not following Christ at all. The temptation here is not so much to fight them, but to join them. And the more you live in a godless culture, the more you might, might start thinking the way that culture thinks in a godless way. Uh, you might leave God out of the picture. You might start loving the things that world, worldly people love that, or sinning in some of the ways that they like to sin. The biggest danger of living in a godless society is not what that society can do to you, but what you might become in that society. That's the temptation that the psalmist is putting from in, in, in front of us and acknowledging that danger and, and also giving us the remedy for that because what rescues you from that serious danger is living in the presence of the living God. Stay close to God in the name of Jesus Christ and by his Holy Spirit, he will remain with you and he will deliver you from all of those temptations. That's the assurance of Psalm 125. And as the psalmist reflected on all of that, his great need for God as the source of all security and also the potential dangers that he might face and his people might face, he did exactly the thing that we've done already this morning for our graduates and he prayed for the people of God. He prayed for them. He was moved to pray for them. He, he wanted God to show them his goodness. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. But as for those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead, lead them away with evildoers. There's a contrast here between good and evil. I, I have to say, when I, I see a verse like this in the Psalms, do good to those who are good, uh, I know enough about human nature our fallen condition always makes me a little uncomfortable when the psalmist is promising a blessing here to those who are good. It may even cause you to wonder whether you could even be, somebody like you could even be included in a promise like that. I think it's important to remember here that these people who are good among the people of God have already been introduced to us as those who trust in the Lord. It's, it's faith that is producing this goodness. They are holy by faith. Everything here, here is consistent with the biblical doctrine of, of salvation by grace. And so we can claim this kind of promise for ourselves as those who are seeking to trust in the Lord. It's our prayer for you as you come to the end of the semester that the Lord would do good to you spiritually intellectually, materially. It's our prayer for our graduates that you would be under the blessing of God. You've, we've prayed for you. We will pray for you again, that God would do good to you as those seeking to live for the Lord. I want to close with this well-known prayer, which I think expresses the security of this psalm and also our the dangerous situation we're in in the world, and, and also how much we need God's protection. Some of you will be very familiar with it, I think. It's, it's Patrick's breastplate. 
a prayer of St. Patrick, which, and he faced all kinds of dangers in uh, taking the gospel to Ireland. Here is how he prayed. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide, guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me from snares of devils, from temptations of vices, from everyone who shall wish me ill. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, on my left, when I lie down, when I sit down, when I arise, I arise today through a mighty strength. This is the hope of believers in Christ who trust in the God of Psalm 125.